Our gospel reading this morning comes from Matthew 16, verses 21 through 28. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord. This must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your minds not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will they profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what, he, what has been done. Truly I tell you, There are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is God's good news. Please be seated. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, we give you thanks for this opportunity to gather together. We pray that the spirit that is stirring within us will move among us, among us, and also lead us from this place so that as we go forth, you may lead us to be the church in the world in all we say and do. Amen. Paradox. If you look up the word paradox in the dictionary, you'll find a definition that runs something like this. A statement or proposition that despite sound or apparently sound reasoning from acceptable premises leads to a conclusion that seems senseless, logically unacceptable or self-contradictory. A situation, person or thing that combines seemingly contradictory features or qualities. A statement or proposition that seems unbelievable, absurd or self-contradictory that when investigated or explained may prove to be well-founded or true. There are many examples of paradoxes in fields from philosophy and literature to mathematics, science, and physics, but I'm going to share just one. The slide on the screen is a paradox of logic. Two buttons, button A and button B. The statement on button button A says the statement on button B is true. But the statement on button B says the statement on button A is false. Trying to assign any truth to either statement A or B, however, leads to a paradox. If the statement on button A is true, then the statement on button B must be as well, but for button B to be true, button A has to be false. Oppositely, if statement A is false, then statement B must be false too, which must ultimately make statement A true. This paradox is a version of the card paradox invented by the British logician Philip Jourdain in the early 1900s. The card paradox is itself a simple variation of what is known as the liar paradox, in which assigning truth values to statements that claim to be either true or false produces a contradiction. And as paradoxes go, this is a relatively simple one. But the greatest of all paradoxes is most assuredly Christianity, because Christ himself is a paradox. Jesus is fully human, yet he is also fully God at the same time. How is that possible? It's a mystery. It seems contradictory, and yet it is the truth. It's a paradox. The dark woods gifts we're exploring today is the gift of emptiness. But what does emptiness have to do with paradox? We'll find the answer to that question as we explore the paradoxes in our gospel reading this morning. So let's begin with Peter. 
Our reading for today takes place immediately after Jesus has asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? Peter responds with a decisive confession, you are the Messiah, the Christ, the son of the living God. And for his answer, Peter receives Jesus' blessing. But then Jesus begins to show his disciples what being the Messiah truly means. Jesus tells his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer at the hands of the Jewish leaders, be put to death, and rise again after three days. Now shocked, Peter pulls Jesus aside and begins, in Matthew's words, to rebuke him. Peter simply can't accept Jesus' words about his coming suffering and death. They don't fit with what the Messiah was supposed to be. Jesus' words seem to Peter to be a paradox. The Messiah is supposed to overthrow the Roman oppressors, not be killed by them. The Messiah is supposed to establish God's rule, power, and authority and restore the independence of the Jewish people by might. The Messiah is supposed to conquer, not die. In Peter's mind, Jesus can't possibly be the Messiah if he is going to suffer and die, and yet Peter knows that Jesus is, in fact, the Messiah, and so that all of Jesus' talk about suffering and dying must be wrong. Jesus answers Peter's words, Peter in words that recall Jesus' answer to Satan during his temptation in the wilderness at the beginning of his ministry. Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus turns to his disciples and says, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? This is one of the paradoxes of Christian discipleship. Jesus' statement seems contradictory, but it's true. But it is vital to note that the word for life doesn't refer to bodily life or material things. The word Jesus uses is psyche, which concerns a person's identity. In other words, their true self, their soul. And it's also important to note here that Jesus' words are addressed to his disciples alone. In the parallel passage in Mark's gospel, Jesus is talking to the disciples and the crowd. But Matthew makes this a family moment. He includes just the disciples. This message is just for them. From here to the end of chapter 18, there are no parables, there are no public instruction and only one miracle exorcism by Jesus. In fact, from this point until chapter 20, 28, Jesus focuses on instructing the disciples, not teaching the crowds. And any time that we read that Jesus is talking to his disciples, we can understand that he's talking to us, too. The people who seek to follow him most closely as his disciples in our time and place. So these words are not an invitation to discipleship for outsiders in Matthew's gospel. They are a reflection on the meaning of discipleship for us, we who have already responded to the call of Christ. Both the context and the qualifying phrase, for me, for my sake, make giving one's life a matter of commitment to the confession of Jesus as the Christ. The people of Matthew's church knew that some who confessed Christ had actually been martyred, including being crucified, and they had every reason to think that such persecution would continue and even intensify. So for them, the call for disciples to take up their cross would have been understood quite literally. But what does it mean for us? 
Yes, there are places, too many places in this world where becoming a Christian is literally a life or death decision. Where proclaiming one's faith in Christ means risking persecution, discrimination, and possible martyrdom. But this country, of course, is not one of them. We can freely confess our faith in Christ and worship in freedom, protected by our country's constitution. So what do Jesus' words here mean to us? Deny yourself and take up your cross? Save your life by losing it? Gain the world only to forfeit your life in the process? How do we live this Christian paradox? We do it by embracing emptiness by giving up ourselves, not in a way that denies or invalidates who we are, but in a way that gets our self out of the way and opens us up to the Holy Spirit, allowing Christ to fill us so that we can become more who we are, our best selves. I know that if I am too full of myself, my own agenda, my desire for control, my self-centeredness and selfishness, there's little room for Christ in me. The closet of my soul needs regular cleaning to throw out those habits, attitudes, behaviors that keep me from becoming my best self, the self that God has created me to be. The gift and paradox of emptiness is that when I empty myself of myself, the more I am willing to embrace uncertainty and surrender myself and my life to God, the more I find my true self. In other words, the more I lose my life for Christ, the more I paradoxically find my true life in Christ. And the more I can become the whole loving person that God has created me and calls me to be. When those first disciples made the choice to accept Jesus' invitation to leave everything behind to follow him, they took a tremendous risk. They didn't even know who Jesus was. They had no idea who they were signing up for or where following Jesus would take them. They had to make a choice. Take the risk of letting go of all the certainties of their lives and embrace this new life following Jesus. So why then did they choose to follow him? Well, in the Gospel of John, there's a point in chapter six where Jesus' teaching became too difficult for many of those who were seeking to be his disciples and they turned away from Jesus and they stopped following him. So when Jesus turned to the 12 disciples and asked them if they too wanted to leave, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom should we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. The disciples chose to follow Jesus because they found in him something they could not find anywhere else. They didn't know where Jesus, where following Jesus would take them, but they sensed that if they chose to follow him, their lives would never be the same. They sensed that they would find a life of meaning and hope that offered them the opportunity to serve God and dedicate their, their lives to a purpose far greater than themselves. If someone were to ask me why I am a Christian, why I choose to follow Christ, my answer would have little to do with where I expect to end up at the end of my earthly life and everything to do with how I am called to live my life in Christ now on earth. I have found that if I want my life to have meaning, to have depth and authenticity, I must live my life for a purpose beyond, greater than myself. And I have found that purpose in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Like Simon Peter and the other disciples, I choose to follow Christ because in Christ I find the words that lead me not just to eternal life, 
but also lead me to real life, that lead me to becoming my best and truest self. One of my favorite definitions of discipleship comes from the author and priest, Father Richard Foster. He writes in his book, The Celebration of Discipline, that spiritual formation, meaning our growth in faith and love of God, is being formed in the image of Christ for the sake of others. Being formed in the image of Christ for the sake of others. In other words, I understand this to mean that the life of of a disciple is a life that involves being drawn into an ever deeper relationship with God. A life that involves allowing Christ to become more and more visible in me so that I can serve others for Christ in the world. In following Christ, we can discover that authentic living is not found in or measured by the length of our life or the accumulation of wealth or status or power or stuff, but rather in the submission of our will to God and in service to others. So each of us must ask ourselves, am I willing to embrace the paradox of discipleship? Am I willing to lose my life in order to save it, to empty myself so that I can be filled with Christ? Amen. And we will have, at this point, um, a time of reflection. We have had a time of reflection each week during Lent, and this week our focus is on how the things that we allow to fill us, things like ego or fear of being unloved or worry of not measuring up, can keep us from fully giving our lives to Christ and giving Christ our best selves. And so during this time of reflection, I invite you to reflect on something that you need to empty out of your life so that Christ can fill you. Or perhaps something in your life, a habit, a behavior, an attitude, or fear that needs to die so that you can live more fully.